Today, we're filming inside the Naugatuck train station, and we're joined with members of the Naugatuck Historical Society, uh, with Wendy Murphy, who is the president of the Naugatuck Society, and with Bridget Mariano. Uh, and your title here is? I'm the secretary. You're the secretary? Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Well, thank you, ladies. I appreciate you having me here, and uh, this is great. Um, and actually, why don't we start talking a little bit about the building itself, uh, this train station, Itself. It's near the actual train station that's used today by Metro North, but this was the original train station, right? Yes, this was the original train station. It was built by Henry Bacon, who also was the architect for the Lincoln Memorial oh, really? in Washington, wow. D.C. It was built about 1910. We've had some recent uh, disagreements about the okay. actual <laughs> building date, um, but about 1910, and it was part of John Howard Woodhorse's plan for the City Beautiful movement okay. that he felt that it was very important that the first thing people saw when they came into town was something beautiful and the last thing they saw when they left was oh, something beautiful. Absolutely. And that that would encourage yeah. visitors. John Moore, who was he? He was our big philanthropist. Oh, okay. He paid for a number of our buildings in town. Uh, we were very fortunate because he had visions and plans for things like city planning and empty space mm -hmm. and uh, zoning long before anybody thought about, oh wait, what's this town going to look like in 40 years? Oh. If we don't plan for the space now, it's not going to happen. And he had the foresight to plan space and buildings in town. Wow. Yeah. Actually, um, I want to go back to the train station. Sure. Um, at one point, the train tracks ran from the center of town, and there was another earlier train station by the firehouse. Okay. But he wanted this train station to be more uh, close to the river, oh. and so that the downtown area would be absent of the train station. Oh, really? That's interesting. All the big, uh, important piece about John Howard Whitmore, as far as the architecture of the town goes, is that he employed in the um, late 1800s and early 1900s, the most uh, important architects in the country. Oh, it was really? a uh, firm called McKinley and White. Okay. Stanford White was one of the uh, architects, and he's considered the, uh, the architect who planned most of the buildings here. Wow. Um, Henry Bacon, who was an architect of this building, when he began his work, started out in the firm of McKinley. Oh, so, really? And because John Howard was uh, so interested in having a beautiful town, he went to the old one the best. And oh, okay. so we're very fortunate. Absolutely. We have the largest concentration of the Kim Mead and White buildings right. anywhere. So even though they built in Newport, Rhode Island and New York City, there's no place that has as many buildings as we do in a square mile area. Really? We have the only McKinney and White Church. Okay. They only made one. Really? And it's another one. Now, what's unique about it? Uh, it's not that it's unique itself, it's that they didn't build churches. Oh. There was okay. also a non uh, St. Martin in the Fields. Oh, okay. And, okay. Um, it's a congregational church, and at that time, most of the congregational churches in the room are, are the wooden ones with the tall steeples. This is a brick building. Okay. It's, it's Stunning. Oh, wow. It's sort of special. And where is it? It's right on the green. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. um, so, so that's pretty much how the building is set down. As far as two of you are concerned, um, where are you from? Do you originally? Uh, how did you get involved with the historical society? That's her fault. That's true. That's true. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, you start with Wendy and I. Well, the City Beautiful movement 
was an official movement that started with uh, the white city in Chicago at the World's, World's Fair. But what the idea was, was that if you have a beautiful place, people will want to come. If you have beautiful buildings and you use them for schools, teachers are inspired. If teachers are inspired, students are inspired. If students are inspired, students come to school and sure. they learn. But John Howard Woodmore believed that if you had a beautiful place, people would be happier, they would be healthier, property values would go up, business would go up, and it was a whole spiraling way to build a whole town economy. And this, you said this started in Chicago or okay. It, John Howard Whittemore had a lot of the same views and opinions that started before the City Beautiful movement officially began in Chicago. But um, there was a lot of people all over the country who had similar, who had similar ideas. It just didn't become a movement. Uh, originally I am originally from Chicago. Yes. 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 And I didn't know about the City Beautiful movement when I was in Chicago. Oh. When did you move out of I came out about 1991 okay. when I uh, got engaged, right. moved down here, transferred, and stopped at Pennefair. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's good. And Arthur is your husband from Yes, he is from about a mile and a half from where we live now. Oh, okay. Uh, but my mother in law is from here. Uh, well, she's she's from her. Yeah, she was in uh, uh, my grandmother in law, who I took care of for oh. a while, was a teacher in town. Oh, really? yes, so there's a lot of generations of uh, Murphy's. Well, that's not Murphy's, but that was the Baxter stuff. So. Uh, uh, okay. What did she teach? Uh, my grandmother taught English, okay. or my grandmother in law taught English, and my mother in law teaches Spanish. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep, at Holy Cross. Oh, excellent. And to ask you, you're from where? I'm originally from the Cajun. Okay. Uh, my husband is from Arkansas. Oh. And, uh, so, of course, Cajun is in Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, interestingly enough, uh, my ex grandmother, uh, Wendy's husband's grandmother, was my husband, one of my husband's teachers. Also. Oh, so really? That's really interesting. So, um, so I guess back to the historical side itself. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, how that was founded, um, was, was, did it work with other communities, things like that, was done to itself, and kind of where it was actually uh, where it sits now. 1859 was the first meeting, and I think it was 19. 19. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite the history. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
which includes history and culture. I know you're involved in culture as well. As you're on that. So, uh, so I think that's great. I mean, it's great that you're able to have a building that really is historic and can be used today. Yes, yes. So, we always say that actually the building is our greatest archive. Yeah. Really, it is true. Actually, can you talk? I know we're not going to walk around here. Can you talk to people? So, like, for example, this behind us, what is this? This is the former town hall. So, where was this? And I know that it's not in existence anymore. Okay. It was where the current town hall is. Oh, right. So, yes, okay. it was in the same place. And like many town halls of that era, it had a theater. Oh, wow. So it was more of a community center than a town hall. Oh, okay. It was multi purpose like many town halls. Wow. But it was built in 1877 and it came down in 1960. For the current uh, modern right. exactly. building. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because if you look at this up here, it's a school classroom. You know, but you said, yeah, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Okay. I think also the, uh, what my husband told me is the eighth grade uh, graduation used to take place. Now, oh, really? See, I've seen that. Yeah. Sure. Um, now, is there anything just Sort of history, history and culture. For example, uh, Sterling Opera House is a very good town the National Historic Register, and a lot of them are done with that kind of story. And for the longest time, I didn't even know there was one in Ansonia, too, which is an opera house in Ansonia that I guess for whatever reason doesn't get much attention in the modernity. Um, is there one, or was there ever one in Mount Cup or even in the surrounding area? No, uh, this, that building that was pretty much it. And I know if we go up further up Route 8, it's constantly Yes. Yeah. No, I don't think there as far as I know, there's like no, there was here. No. Uh, there was some outdoor auditorium. There was some outdoor staging area up near Hillside School that was there that used to be between uh, where the parking lot actually is for Hillside School now. So Hillside oh. School is uh, one of the buildings that's also uh, was built by John Howard Whittemore that was the high school for a number of years. But it's also a brick place, believe it or not, because oh, really? yes, along that brick road, you can enter at the ground level on three different floors from the same street. Oh, wow. So you start it and you can go in and you're really in the basement, but it's ground level and then you go up a little bit and you go in again oh, and you're on the first floor. It's, it's, like, uh, it's like a Hesher pick. Really <laughs> keep going and you don't even know where you are. Yes. That's great. Now, I'm sorry, but you said brick road. You made me think of it. Wizard of Yeah, yes. you talked a little bit about it. Greenberg. Aiden Greenberg was born um, 1903 okay. here in Longtuck. He right. went to Salem School in Longtuck and Longtuck High School. His parents uh, ran a uh, millinery okay. store in Longtuck, but they catered to the wealthy people in the area. They traveled to New York every week okay. and they always bought the latest styles and hats and other uh, clothing. So that he grew up in that milieu where um, people were designing things, right. especially hats. Hats were very important. If you ever see any of his movies, the hats are extraordinary. So um, when he graduated from high school, he was sent to the Fashion Institute in New York, but he didn't like it very much um, for whatever reason. He eventually went to Paris, and in Paris he was discovered Eventually he came back to New York, he was discovered, went to Hollywood, and um, he, he designed clothing for Narbo, oh, yeah. and all those kinds of stars in the 1930s. And then, of course, we, we talk a lot about the Wizard of Oz, sure, because sure. he did all of the designs, of the clothing designs. For where, the now, when he was doing that, where was he actually producing and designing that? Well, was well, it like Hollywood? Yeah. Moved out of Dodge. He right. was living in Hollywood. Oh, he was over the Green Street Credit Card. Oh, yes. He was, yeah. like, was 39 and he was the boss. Yes. He was prior to that. Yeah. But, but the story, right. the story is, is that while he was in school at Salem in Narcotech, right. that was when he did all of his initial sketches. Oh, for the yeah. And that was his favorite book. And he had a whole sketchbook of different designs. 
designs and how he wanted the cosmos to be. And when he got the job, he had to call his sister, who was still living in the state, but not an architect, and said, you need to go in storage, you, you need to go find my sister. I am sure they do, but they don't want well, us. <laughs>
did it, did it then get manufactured right here, or would it go to, you know, Detroit, or, you know, where was well, it? Well, it was a rubber industry in the United States, but okay. the problem with the rubber, um, prior to 1843, when he developed the process of authorization, was that the rubber would become very brittle okay. in the winter and very soft in the summertime, so right. it, it, it wasn't a really good product. Right. He became obsessed with this problem. And he just did experiment after experiment right. until he finally developed a way of using chemicals and heat to, right. to perfect the process. So once he did that, he actually had, he did not have enough money to establish the industry. Okay. He sold the license right. for that uh, localization process to a man named Samuel Lewis. The okay. Lewis family was very prominent in oh. North And they established Oh, so it was not here. Oh, yeah, it was down here. In fact, that's what it was called, Rubber City. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. I have heard that. There's Rubber Road still. I mean, at its peak, there were about 5,000 to 6,000 people who worked in the factories. When was the time frame? Well, it started in 1843. Okay. And by the time 1900, you know, they were, it was 1892 or 1894, all the rubber companies. Oh. Eventually, um, the process, the uh, manufacturing of the product in Nantucket became only what they Okay. That was to, um, they were having trouble with plants in other parts of the uh, United States. Right. So they consolidated all of them to where the process is here in Nantucket. And I always find one thing interesting about that is people in Nantucket sometimes will trace their families to um, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, right. Bristol, Rhode Island, a number of places like that. Those factories closed and people came here to know how to to work in the factory. So that took place in the late 1920s. Then the company continued to expand and it was very profitable. And it was a work for a long time until um, things started to go being produced overseas. And that really started in the 60s and by the uh, 1970s, the uh, process of um, eliminating the factories here. Right. 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 So it was a long, long industry. We have one volunteer who comes in uh, once or twice a month and helps us. She talks about how in some of the days when the kids were little, if her husband was sick, because he, I guess he had some diabetes kind of thing, if he was sick, then she would go down in the morning and say, look, I'd like to get a job for third shift. They'd say, okay, show up for third shift. Wow. Like yeah. there was there was that much work. work. Yeah, yeah. 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 So she said she goes, so I should go I go work for a little while and get better and I'd go back home with the kids oh, and he'd goodness. go to work and then I'd get to go back to work and they wow. went back and forth. But it was the jobs were just then. Yeah. And on the personal level, uh, forever indebted to the creatures full compensation because that's how we're talking about. Usually though, know, if you talk about things like what about that when you talk about, you know, too brittle, I can imagine because I've used um, there's a plastic ball they have yeah. 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 The original one we used was one color was arm, and you hit it against the curb with a shatter if it was too cold. So then it was like a boom to the industry when they came out with like a blue softer that, you know, but then in the summertime, the cool one that really was a The orange one would actually So I don't think those are the ones that are popular, but the rubber. Yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking if it was off the blue, it the actual ice hockey puck. That was brittle. I mean, imagine that just yeah. shattered. Yeah. Things like that. So, um, Industry. Matter of fact, there's the show, it's a show how it's made. Yes, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, they had the show that. I didn't even know how they, I mean, I figured that was a stamp, but they just take slabs of rubber and just throw them between the two rollers, and they keep adding the chemicals and powders to keep yeah. them you know, smooth and uh, together. And they mentioned that there's a bunch of rubber that comes in. And, you know, it's interesting. When you think about it, that was going on for a little while. Tires were not done. Oh, no. oh, yeah. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yes. thinks that. Yes. And they weren't done. There was some retreading that happened after the war. There was all these trucks that were decommissioned that needed tires. So there was some retreading that happened. But the Goodyear Tire Company only has its name. So Goodyear, that's it. And it only has its name because Charles Goodyear died penniless. Oh, really? Yes. He spent a lot so of his time. So it wasn't necessarily, it was sort of like, 
No, it well, was I think a, because it was a famous name. Yes, uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it came with some money yeah. to that next uh, generation. Uh, yeah. I think I think the Goodyear company bought the name because by then it was associated with a little bit more prominence and sure. a little more respect yeah. yeah. as opposed to what it was when before Matt died. And we spent time in debtors' prison. Oh, really? His wife must have been a very patient woman. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Well, 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 she was married, she was married twice. Yes. And, uh, with nine children, she was first wife. The words were not her name was Clarissa okay. Porter uh, from an old one, a family that had right. been about for a long time. And she had a lot of relatives here, which over the years helped him out financially quite a bit. Um, but I think about six of his children died. There was a lot of death in that family. They were very, very poor. And any money he ever made before it went back into uh, experimentation with rubber. Oh. You know, he got, it, it was the highs and lows, really. He made so a lot of money and then he was losing. Uh, he was a debtor in prison in Philadelphia, oh, yeah. Paris, and London. So he was a debtor in Washington. He was at the World's Fair in London. And yes. So, yeah. I mean, we got around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you have any comments on the show, feel free to provide feedback, questions, or suggestions to lookingupvalley at gmail.com or check out our Facebook page and dedicated website. Thank you very much.